Hello, and welcome to Be Still and Know. Today's video is going to be a continuation of the Ancient Astronaut series, and today's video is going to be features of ancient astronaut theory, mysterious ancient structures built using advanced mathematics, methods, and tools from the Americas Part 2. So let's dive right in. Let's go over the ancient astronaut theory again. The definition is sometimes referred to as ancient alien theory, Ancient astronaut theory is the idea that intelligent, self-aware, extraterrestrial, interdimensional, inner-earth dwelling, or even time-traveling beings visited Earth and made contact with humans in antiquity and prehistoric times. Proponents suggest that this contact influenced the development of modern cultures, technologies, architecture, religions, and even human biology. A common position is that deities from most, if not all, religions are extraterrestrial in origin, and that advanced technologies brought to Earth by ancient astronauts were interpreted as evidence of divine status by early humans. So that's our definition. We've been going over that for the last few videos. Today's video, we're going to start off in Peru. The Nazca Lines are a group of very large geoglyphs formed by depressions or shallow incisions made in the soil of the Nazca Desert in southern Peru. They were created between 500 BCE and 500 CE. The Nazca lines number in the thousands and the vast majority of them date from 200 BC to 500 AD to a time when people referred to as the Nazca inhabited the region. The earliest lines created with piled up stones date as far back as 500 BC. The Nazca people were an ancient prehistoric culture that was successful in using engineering techniques to bring underground water to the surface for irrigation. However, little is known about this pre-Incan culture as they left no written record. So here are some images of the Nazca lines. The one on the left is not, I don't think that they're all together like that. I think that's just a representation of what they look like. That might be all together, I'm not sure. There's a hummingbird, the famous hummingbird. The lines were made by scraping away the reddish iron oxide covered stones that cover the desert surface to reveal the white sand beneath. In most places, wind, rain, and erosion would quickly remove all traces of this within a few years. This sublayer contains high amounts of lime, which with the morning mist hardens to form a protective layer that shields the lines from winds, thereby preventing erosion. At Nazca though, the lines have been preserved because it is such a windless, dry, and isolated location. Most lines run straight across the landscape, but there are also figurative designs of animals and plants made up of lines. The individual figurative geoglyph designs measure between 0.2 and 0.7 miles across. The combined length of all the lines is over 808 miles, and the group cover of an area of about 19 square miles. The lines are typically 10 to 15 centimeters deep. The width of the lines varies considerably, but over half are just over a foot wide. In some places, they may be only a foot wide, and in others, reach six feet wide. So there's a giant spider. There's another figure. It looks like he's raising his arm. And then I don't know what that is in the middle. <laughs> some of the Nazca lines form shapes that are best seen from the air, though they are visible from the surrounding foothills and other high places. The shapes are usually made from one continuous line. The largest one are about 1,200 feet long. Because of its isolation and the dry, windless, stable climate of the plateau, the lines have mostly been preserved naturally. Extremely rare changes in weather may temporarily alter the general designs. As of 2012, the lines are said to have been deteriorating because of an influx of squatters inhabiting the lands. The figures vary in complexity. Hundreds are simple lines and geometric shapes. More than 70 are zoomorphic designs of animals such as hummingbirds, spiders, fish, llama, jaguar, monkey, lizard, dog, and a human. Other shapes include trees and flowers. Scholars differ in interpreting the purpose of the designs, but in general, they ascribe religious significance to them. They were designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1994. 
The first published mention of the Nazca Lines was by Pedro Ciesa de Leon in his book of 1553, and he mistook them for trail markers. In 1586, Luis Monzon reported having seen ancient ruins in Peru, including the remains of Rhodes. Although the lines are partially visible from the nearby hills, the first to report them were the Peruvian military and civilian pilots. In 1927, the Peruvian archaeologist Toribio Mejia Cespe spotted them while he was hiking through the foothills. He discussed them at a conference in Lima in 1939. The discovery of 143 new geoglyphs was announced in 2019 by Yamagata University and IBM Japan using machine learning based methods. So these in the middle are some of the ones that were discovered recently. That looks like a dinosaur to me, I don't know about you. Paul Kosick, an American historian from Long Island University, is credited as the first scholar to study the Nazca lines at length. In Peru in 1940 to 41, to study ancient irrigation systems, he flew over the lines and realized one was in the shape of a bird. Another chance observation helped him see how the lines converged at the winter solstice in the southern hemisphere. He began to study how the lines might have been created, as well as try to determine their purpose. He was joined by archaeologists Richard P. Schadel from the United States and Maria Reich, a German mathematician and archaeologist from Lima, to help determine the purpose of the Nazca lines. They proposed one of the earliest reasons for the existence of the figures to be markers on the horizon to show where the sun and other celestial bodies rose on significant dates. So again, I didn't really include this one in my uh, other video about uh, structures aligned to the stars, I should have, but this was also a time marker it looks like, and aligned to solstices and equinoxes. Archaeologists, historians, and mathematicians have all tried to determine the purpose of the lines. Determining how they were made has been easier than determining why they were made. Scholars have theorized the Nazca people could have used simple tools and surveying equipment to construct the lines. Archaeological surveys have found wooden stakes in the ground at the end of some of the lines, which supports this theory. One such stake was carbon dated and was the basis for establishing the age of the design complex. Refuting the hypothesis of Eric von Donekin that the lines had to have been created by ancient astronauts, prominent skeptic Joe Nickel has reproduced the figures using tools and technology available to the Nazca people. Scientific American called his work remarkable in its exactness when compared to the existing lines. With careful planning and simple technologies, Nickel provided that a small team of people could recreate even the largest figures within days without any aerial assistance. So that, that uh, uh, nickel was trying to disprove Eric von Donneken. If you know about Eric von Donneken, you know that he's traveled to this area and has been a proponent of the idea that these must have been created by a people that had aerial technology because they can only be seen in their fullness from the sky. And uh, this guy nickel is saying, no, we, could, we recreated it without using aerial technology. So it is possible to make these without aerial technology, but for what reason would you make them besides to be seen from high up in the sky? So I still believe that Eric von Donneken is on the right track, that these were meant to be seen from the sky and were most likely, I think, a map. Most of the lines are formed on the ground by a shallow trench with a depth between 10 to 15 centimeters. Such trenches were made by removing the reddish brown iron oxide coated pebbles that cover the surface of the Nazca Desert. When this gravel is removed, the light-colored clay earth exposed in the bottom of the trench produces lines and contrasts sharply in color with the tone of the surrounding land surface. A group called the Nazca Group has recently used existing earth grid theories to come up with a new hypothesis that the Nazca lines represent a world grid or map. Some have speculated that this world grid allowed ETs to orient themselves when emerging from stargates or wormholes or landing on earth. The Nazca group claims the lines and geoglyphs carved into the Nazca Plateau represent a map of the Earth. The map is a great circle map. The nominic projection with the center of the Earth as its cartographic viewpoint. Each line of the Nazca Plateau represents a great circle of navigation centered at the center of the Earth and encircling the entire planet. The virtual imagery shows that the Nazca Plateau, Machu Picchu, Sacsayhuaman, the Giza Plateau, Petra, Ur, and Eridu Persepolis, Mohenjo-Daro, Angkor Wat, and other ancient sites of great renown are in close geographic alignment with the Great Circle as it circles back to Easter Island and its ancient monolithic Moai. 
In summary, a significant number of cradles of civilization and ancient sites of great renown are found along the course of the primary great circle RA. So this is a map with the lines laid out, and these are the Nazca lines. And they're saying that this is actually a world map. And it represents, so you can see Easter Island on the lower left-hand corner, and that it goes all around the world, and these lines cross through major monolithic sites from the past. So I think that's amazing that if you put this on a, on a world map, that these lines are so accurate. They actually go through these ancient sites. The Cyclopean Great Circle, named thus after the gigantic scale of masonry and structural ruins found along its course, was first noticed by a man named Jim Allison. Allison had noticed that the Cyclopean and many other Great Circle alignments from the empirical evidence provided by the geographical locations of the sites themselves. Such Great Circle alignments of ancient sites had previously been ignored, as had their profound historical implications. Allison found that sites of import were located at equidistant intervals of geometric significance along the course of the Cyclopean Great Circle. Other investigators such as Robert Bavall and Graham Hancock had previously noted equidistant longitude relationships between ancient sites of note, echoing Jim Allison's findings. Jim Allison had strongly suspected that Nazca itself, a site in the Cyclopean Great Circle alignment, represented a diagram of the Great Circle's alignment. Jim Allison was not only correct, but was himself directly involved in the development of this present work, which owes much of its insight and collaboration. The purpose behind the Great Circle alignments of the ancient sites and the Nazca map become clear when other phenomena under the Great Circles are discerned, impact craters and volcanic calderas. These two cataclysmic categories of phenomena are also in Great Circle alignment with the Great Circles of the Nazca map. A fourth category of submerged monuments includes submerged archaeological sites of recent discovery or rumor that are found suggestively near the courses of the Great Circles of the Nazca map. So basically these people are saying that there's a a way to map out all these ancient volcanoes and calderas and ancient sites and that they all align with these lines, these, this great cyclopean circle. So I think that's kind of amazing. It's a little bit above my understanding. I'm not someone that likes maps. I'm not a cartographer, so I don't really give a shit about that. But I think that it's still amazing that ancient peoples were able to make these maps. So that's one um, theory for what the Nazca lines are, is a giant map. To orient or key the Nazca map, one begins with the geoglyphs that depict two llamas. The figure on the right of the llamas is often referred to as their pen or corral. The llamas suggest a clear and particular association with South America, specifically with the Andean region where the map itself is found. Therefore, the llama's geoglyph is cartographically assigned as representing the Nazca Andean region of the Earth. The nearest geoglyph eastward of the llamas is that of the spider monkey scene. The monkey appears hanging inverted from a jagged line formation that resembles a mountain chain, suggestive of the Andes Mountains. This is geographically reasonable. As one moves eastward from Nazca over the Andes Mountains, one drops into the western Amazon basin where spider monkeys abound. The spider monkey glyph is therefore cartographically assigned to the southwestern region of the Amazon basin. Southward from the Amazon river is a figure often misidentified as a dog. The rounded ears and its inverted hanging orientation are strongly suggestive of a tamandua, a semi-arboreal mammal that is unique to South America, inhabiting a vast range of forests and savannas south of the Amazon river. So as you can see, uh, these designs are said to be um, representations of different regions of the planet. So the llamas, the monkey, and the tamandua. Another unique element in question must be the anomalous Okavango River Delta in Africa. The Okavango River and its delta are geographic anomalies. The Okavango River is the only major river on earth that flows inland, away from the sea, and empties into the African savanna. As the only major river on Earth with an inland river delta, its uniqueness provides a highly specific geographic location. Even in our present day, from a high vantage over the modern day Botswana, the Okavango River Delta bears an uncanny likeness to the Delta Geoglyph. So as you can see, that, that uh, design is supposedly the African Okavango River Delta. So that's supposedly the African area. Here are some more images of the Nazca Lines. All right, so we're gonna move on now to the ancient site of Casas Grandes, or also known as Paquime. 
and that is in Chihuahua, Mexico. Casas Grandes, which is Spanish for great houses, also known as Paquime, is a prehistoric archaeological site in the northern Mexican state of Chihuahua. Construction of the site is attributed to the Mogolan or Mogollon culture, and Casas Grandes is one of the largest and most complex Mog Mogolan culture site in the region. Settlement began after 1130 CE, and the larger buildings developed into multi-story dwellings after 1350 CE. The community was abandoned approximately 1450 CE. Casas Grandes is regarded as one of the most significant Mogollon archaeological zones in the northwestern Mexico region, linking it to other sites in Arizona and New Mexico and the United States, and exhibiting the expanse of the Mogollon sphere of influence. And here is an image of Casas Grandes and a map of the span of the Mogollon culture, which is the green right there. All right, Casas Grandes complex is located in a wide fertile valley on the Casas Grandes or San Miguel River, 35 miles south of Hanos and 150 miles northwest of the state capital, the city of Chihuahua. The settlement relied on irrigation to support its agriculture and the archaeological zone is contained within the eponymous modern municipality of Casas Grandes. The valley and region have been inhabited by indigenous groups for thousands of years. Between CE 1130 and 1300, the area's inhabitants began to congregate in small settlements in this wide fertile valley. The largest identified settlement is known today as Paquime or Casas Grandes. It began as a group of 20 or more house clusters, each with a plaza and enclosing wall. These single-story adobe dwellings shared a common water system. Evidence shows that Paquime had a complex water control system that included underground drain systems, reservoirs, channels for water to get to the homes, and a sewage system. After being burned about 1340, Casas Grandes was rebuilt with multi-story apartment buildings to replace the small buildings. Casas Grandes consisted of about 2,000 adjoining rooms built of adobe, I-shaped Mesoamerican ball courts, stone face platforms, effigy mounds, and a market area. About 350 other small settlement sites have been found in the Casas Grandes area, some as far as 39 miles away. Archaeologists believe that the area directly controlled by Casas Grandes was relatively small, extending out about 19 miles from the city. The population may have been about 2,500 in Casas Grandes with perhaps 10,000 people living within its area of control. Casas Grandes was abandoned in about 1450. It is unclear whether it was abandoned slowly over a period of years or quickly. The Spanish explorer Francisco de Ibarra found the site of Casas Grandes in 1565. The Indians nearby, non-agricultural nomads, probably Suma or Hano, told him that a war with village dwellers, the Opata, four days journey west had caused the abandonment of Casas Grandes and that the inhabitants had moved six days journey north. This story suggests the people of Casas Grandes joined the Pueblos on the Rio Grande in New Mexico. Other theories are that the Casas Grandes people migrated west to Sonora and joined or became the Opata, whom the Spaniards found in the mid-16th century living in statelets, small but well-organized city-states. Some speculate the Tarumara people may be the descendants of the people from Paquime. It is also possible that the Casas Grandes was abandoned because opportunities were greater elsewhere. Other communities in the southwest are known to have been abandoned in favor of a new home. The language of the inhabitants Casas Grandes spoke is unknown. Given the Mesoamerican influence on Casas Grandes, Nahuatl was probably widely spoken, but it was not the primary language of the people, and Nahuatl is the language of the Aztecs. In the mid-1300s, until its abandonment a century later, we see Paquime playing an influential role in the religion and social organization of the societies north of the modern-day Mexican border. Through Paquime, we see evidence of Mesoamerican ideas, those values, attitudes, and beliefs from central Mexico, flowing northward along with highly sought-after trade goods. What archaeologists call the Pueblo IV period in the American Southwest was characterized by droughts, migrations, and radical social changes. During this time, murals at ancient Pueblo sites became more complex and feature imagery and iconography not seen in the area before. A good example of this can be found at a site called Pottery Mound, dating to the mid-1300s, located about an hour southwest of modern-day Albuquerque, New Mexico, where intact paintings show somewhat realistic people holding Mexican tropical birds. 
Public buildings and open spaces changed in accordance with the southern influence too. Kivas and the pueblos were replaced by larger Mexican-style plazas. Also during the Haida Pakime, ritual feasting started to become more widespread throughout the Pueblo areas and rock art and ceramics began to depict mass kachina and warfare imagery. It was at this time when clown and medicine societies began to emerge in the Pueblos. Some archaeologists go so far as to theorize that an entire religious and social complex was imported by the Pueblos from Pakime and adapted to local needs. So as you can see in some of this pottery, uh, there are a lot of different styles going on here. Um, a lot of different influences from the clown societies of, the, of North America to uh, some of the uh, Mesoamerican uh, influences from uh, Mexico. The trade and breeding of macaws from the jungles of Mexico was a very widespread tradition in Mogollon culture and evidence of this has been found in Paquime in their pottery and art. A mummified macaw head has also been discovered in a cave in the American Southwest. So birds, and especially macaws, uh, these beautiful um, tropical birds were widely traded and uh, were kept as pets. An interesting case study of Pakime's religious influence over the American Southwest can be explored by looking at two gods who are nearly identical, found both in central Mexico and the American Southwest. Xochipilli, also known as the Flower Prince, was found in central and southern Mexico and was very similar to Payatemu, or what has been termed the Sun Youth of the Rio Grande and Colorado River Pueblos as well as Sun Face of the Hopi people. These gods are associated with the sun and are often depicted as wearing the headdress of a scarlet macaw. These gods greet the rising sun with a flute and are associated with flowers, butterflies, youth, art, sensuality, game playing, and fertility. Xochipilli is also associated with provisions, generation, and growth of corn. He is the companion to the corn maiden. The sun youth of the Pueblos brings the corn maiden to the fields and is associated with the rituals having to do with the growth and harvest of corn. Both the Mesoamerican god and the old Pueblo god are associated with the ritual feasting, the clown societies, political organization, and curing illnesses. Archaeologists conclude that through Paquime, the Xochipilli god idea found its way to the southwestern Pueblos and was slightly changed to fit local needs. There are many other examples of such similarities. So here we have images of Xochipilli, and so let's go over this real quick. From left to right, it is a modern illustration of Xochipilli, and then the next one over is an Aztec statue of Xochipilli, and then the next one over is the second Aztec statue of Xochipilli, and then the next one over is Payatemu, it's a Payatemu Kachina from the Zuni Pueblo, and then the next one over is Payatemu, also known as the Sun Youth, Kachina, from Arizona. And then the next one over is the Hopi Sun Face Kachina. So kind of how a, a similar um, deity was taken in different parts of the Americas. And Payutemu is the supernatural patron of all Tsutsukutu, yellow, clown Kachinas, as well as Kosa, black and white clown Kachinas, pictured below Payatemu Kachina. So the clown societies were very closely associated with the sun and Kachina dolls. All right. So let's go over some of the architecture from these sites from Pakime and other southwestern sites and see how they're similar. Specialized craft activities included the production of copper bells and ornaments, extensive pottery and beads from marine mollusks. These crafts were probably distributed by an extensive trading network. Casas Grandes pottery has a white or reddish surface with ornamentation in blue, red, brown, or black. It is sometimes considered to be of better manufacture than the modern pottery in the area. Effigy bowls and vessels were often found formed in the shape of painted human figures. Casas Grandes pottery was traded among prehistoric peoples as far north as present-day New Mexico and Arizona and throughout northern Mexico. So here are some Aztec ruins on the left. And I wanted to point out how all of these ruins from a similar culture have this similar door shape. And there's Chaco Canyon in the middle, and then there's Casas Grandes on the right. And they all have these circular stone areas, and they all have these T-shaped doors, door openings. Very strange. 
The archaeologist Stephen Lexon has noted that Paquime is aligned on roughly the same longitudinal axis as Chaco Canyon and Aztec ruins with an error of only a few miles. Chaco Canyon reached its cultural peak first, then Aztec and Paquime. The similarities among these sites may indicate that their ruling elites also had a ceremonial connection. Lexon proposed that ruling elites, once removed from their prior positions at Chaco, re-establish their hegemony over the area at Aztec and later Paquime. This idea, though, remains controversial and is not as widely accepted as often reported. It has been proposed, and more widely accepted, that the origins of Paquime can be found in its connection with the Mogollon culture. And my personal theory is that the Aztec culture um, started in northern uh, the northern area of uh, New Mexico and Arizona and then migrated south to where the Aztecs eventually started their culture, the, their greater culture in Mexico. That was their legend anyways, it was that they migrated south from the northern area. That's what I think. Various theories exist as to the inhabitants of Casas Grandes, but the most logical relationship of Casas Grandes to Cuarenta Casas, which is also known as 40 houses in English, 60 miles to the south, and to TJ ruins and Gila Cliff, 200 miles to the north, led to the common agreement that the site is part of the Mogollon culture sphere of influence. Three other theories compete to explain its existence. The archaeologist Charles C. De Peso advanced the theory that Casas Grandes was a backwater until about 1200 CE when Pochteca traders from the Aztec Empire or other Mesoamerican states to the south turned it into a major trading center. A diametrically opposed theory is that Casas Grandes was established by the elites of the ancestral Puebloans from the north who were leaving Chaco Canyon and other areas during their decline. The third theory is that Casas Grandes is a purely local creation, a community that grew over time to dominate its region and adopted some religious and social customs from the civilizations of Mesoamerica. There is common academic agreement that trading existed between the cultures of Mesoamerica, Arido America, and the American Southwest, though not on a large or planned scale. As no system like the Pochteca existed in the north, the architectural remains throughout yet share a commonality of knowledge from north to south that included such ancient population centers such as Snake Town. Another similarity we see at Casas Grandes is the style of doorway also seen in other places of the Americas, even as far south as the Inca Empire in Peru with the giant doorway of Amarumuru. So here are some images of Cuarenta Casas in Chihuahua and it's another cliff dwelling that has the T-shaped doors and then on the right you see Gila Cliff in New Mexico another cliff dwelling also with T-shaped doors. And so that's going to lead us into our next site in the Americas which is in Peru and this is Aramumuru near Lake Titicaca, Peru. Aramumuru, sometimes spelled Amarumuru, is a stone carving near Lake Titicaca that is known as the Gate of the Gods. And that's what I'm talking about, this stone T-shaped door. It is said to be a stargate or portal that a great Inca priest from Coricancha Temple named Aramumuru escaped through during the Spanish conquest of the Inca. According to a local legend, this gate leads to the spirit world, or even to the world of the gods. The portal was made in the distant past. In those times, the great Inca heroes could pass through the portal and join the pantheon of gods. Sometimes these gods would return to earth through these gates to inspect all the lands in the kingdom. Legends tell that the gate was open for a while in the 16th century. Back then, Spanish conquistadors were looting the immense treasures in Cusco and slaughtering local people. In the most important Inca temple, Coricancha, location of the present church of Santo Domingo, were located especially valuable relics, the golden discs. According to the legend, these discs were given by the gods to the Inca, these discs were claimed to have powerful healing abilities. Two of these discs were seized by Spaniards, but the third one, the largest, disappeared without a trace. Aramumuru had managed to take the large golden disc with him when he escaped Cusco. Aramumuru reached the Hayu Marca Hills and hid there for a while. He stumbled on Inca priests, guardians of the portal, and when the guardians saw the golden disc, there was arranged a special ritual at the gate. The secret ritual opened the giant portal and blue light was shining from it. Amarumuru entered the portal and was never seen again. The gate has been named after him. Later this place was found by Spaniards and they desecrated it, removed any visible artifacts and declared it an evil place, a gateway to hell. 
Legend goes on and tells about the future. One day this portal will open. It will be much larger than it seems now. Gods will return through it to the earth and in their sonships. The presence of such doorways in the architecture of Casas Grandes, Cuarenta Casas, and several southwest cultures, including the Aztecs, and as far south as the Inca Empire in Peru at Amaramuru, shows they may have had knowledge of extraterrestrial technology such as stargates and portals, and this knowledge was widespread. It is well known that many southwest cultures have legends of star beings that came to Earth to teach humanity agriculture and technology. Maybe these doorways were their primary means of transportation between cultures and other planets, galaxies, or dimensions. So there are some images of the door as if it was a stargate. And who knows? Who knows if this was an ancient uh, portal or wormhole or stargate? It could have been. You know, that's... Really interesting how all these doors have the same shape. And then we have this legend of one of them being a uh, wormhole or a stargate. Really interesting stuff. But that's the ending of this part. So remember, uh, if you do like this video and you like uh, this new series that I'm doing on ancient astronaut theory, please support me. Please subscribe and like my videos. Um, you can uh, support me through PayPal, through Cash App. Thank you again for joining me at Be Still and Know with Adam. Remember that no matter what comes your way, it's going to be a great day. Thanks again for joining me. I'll see you later.